we understand as a church, you know, victory is so important. There's the good voice, what I would call the V's to victory, the, the voice of good news. That was what Jesus did when you heard his voice, when they yelled at him, Rabboni, when they yelled, Son of David, any word they used to, to recognize him, and Jesus spoke back. It was a good voice. Amen. And we also have to trust and understand the validity of our message. This message is like no other. There's no other message like the good news, the gospel. It's, and it's, it's for thousands of years, it is still relevant. Everybody say relevant. There are things you know that are no longer relevant. Our society is changing. I'll give you one word. Men's bathroom. Women's bathroom. It's no longer relevant. You can go to either one in our society. They don't, they don't carry the weight they used to. Amen. It's, it's weird how that is, isn't it? We're changing. There's a, a shift going on. But I go back. I, that's why if you are a Bible man or woman, it's relevant. This is relevant. It's right now. It doesn't change. It's still good for today. I want to talk to you out of the book of Psalm, chapter 107, Psalm 107. It was a very historical psalm. King David, when he wrote it, he was given a decree. It's a king's decree. In other words, it's a law. He said, you know, this to me is a law. This is something that I've lived with. Whether you think it's a law or not, this is how I live, Psalm 107. It's also prophetic. In other words, though it was good thousands of years ago for David to say it during the time of his kingdom, and remember, whatever the king said was law. So if he said it, it had power behind it. It, it had prestige behind it. So now we read that David is starting to share something, amen, that is also prophetic for our day. When I say prophetic, I mean it transcends time, comes all the way up into August 2020. And it means something to us today. I can grab hold of this. Amen. There's value in humanity. When I look at people, I always think to myself, that person has value. I don't care if they're on a, on a bicycle. Last week I mentioned Lloyd to you who was a bicycle, ran out in front of his motorcycle, and he hit it. And when I went to see Lloyd, by the way, he's home now, which is a great thing. But when I went to see Lloyd, every bone in his face is broken and crushed, and got titanium plates in, and I looked at him, and he said, you know, Pastor, I need to go buy that guy a bicycle. And I thought to myself, what gospel? Because this is not the same man that many years ago I saw had, had, ang had anger inside of him. But now look what God has done. The, the life-changing gospel changed this man's life to the point that he's in the hospital. It's another man's fault, and he said, I need to go buy him a bicycle because I got lots of stuff. He ain't got nothing. I thought, my God in heaven, I'm just learning something right now. Amen. Because sometimes I can get a little angry too. I'm from the south side of the kingdom. Can I get an amen? <laughs> When you're from the south side, you backslide just a little bit. You got to watch yourself. So that's important. But let's talk about that voice. Good news. Good news. The voice. The voice. When I showed up in Colorado, my grandson, he just did really, you know, that song, I, I, I think he walks on water. I think he thinks I walk on water. And when I'm standing outside the vehicle, Katie actually videoed it. When he found out I was there, I was talking to him on my phone, and I said, hey, bud, uh, your papa's here. And he come out that screen door, I mean, running full speed to give me a big old hug. It was a voice of good news to him, amen, that his papa had came. There's nothing like the voice of good news. I still have voices on my phone of those who have gone on to the kingdom of God. Their voices mean something to me, to hear a voice of good news, to let that thing ring inside of me. We've been commissioned to share good news. Not bad. This book is good news, not bad. It's unique news, not just forgiving, but forgotten sin. Not just healed of diseases or symptoms, but cured of the cause of it, which is sin. So when I walk into the book of Psalm, chapter 107, are you comfortable? Again, let me say it's a king's decree. The good news is we have the answer. As a matter of fact, there are so many problems, so many problems, just one answer. And you've heard it a lot. Jesus is the answer. Well, what's he the answer to? The world would yell out. What's he the answer to? Well, I'm fixing to give you the answers that he is the answer to. Because there's a lot of problems in this world, but I only know one answer. And, and I just keep directing people there. They call me. I direct them toward him. I say, get in, a, get in a rocking chair somewhere. Take a ride. Do something. But listen to me. The only answer I know for your problem right now is Jesus. When the song was about Jesus a while ago, uh, you 
you know, I just want to say his name, Jesus. Say it with me. Jesus. Say something about his name. So the Scripture says in Psalm 107, verse 6, Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them hmm, out of their distresses. Would you mind if I back up just a little bit? Reaching for my Bible. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. This is verse 1 of Psalm 107. His love endures forever. One scripture uses the word mercy. Let the redeemed of the Lord say this. Those he redeemed from the hand of the foe. Those he gathered from the lands, from east, west, north, south. Some wandered in desert wastelands, finding no way to a city when they could settle. They were hungry and thirsty, and their lives ebbed away. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distresses. I will use the word poverty just to be able to say some, some uh, alliteration here, which I like. So I'm going to use that one word. But poverty could simply mean lack of, not enough of, uh, not as much as somebody else. Father, I thank you for your word. Your anointing rest on me. Lord, let me speak forth the word of truth to people. Let it be good news in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Amen. When, when I read this scripture, uh, it, it says of them, and I wish I'd have put that on the overhead. My bad, guys. I've been running almost on empty. But I want you to back up to verse 4 if you've got your Bibles open. Some wandered in desert wastelands, finding no way to a city where they could settle. They were hungry and thirsty, and their lives ebbed away. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. Oh, if I could teach people that your answer is not always in a societal uh, building or somewhere else or, or, or a food bank somewhere else, but if I could learn to cry to the Lord, if I could talk to Him and I could say to Him, God, I need help. I'm financially struggling. I'm struggling with food. I'm, str I'm thirsty. He said to us over and over, if you're thirsty, come to me. Amen. They that thirst and hunger after righteousness will be filled. He said these things over and over to us. The problem here, poverty, verse 4 and 5, they wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Often, historically, we saw the Israelites, after deliverance from slavery, wandering. They were often going from place to place wandering. Then they would cry out for help. They'd cry out when they were thirsty, and Moses would speak to a rock. We later found out that rock was Christ Jesus. Amen. He was in the Old Testament as well in the New. Can I get an amen? He spoke to the rock. Amen. What were they doing, though? The people were crying out. They were crying out, and as they cried out, water came forth. Many times, is it pride? Is it pride that stops us from crying out? Hey, I'm not crying out to you, but I can have a private moment with God and swallow my pride and say, God, help me. I'm thirsty. I'm hungry. I don't have the finances to cover the nonsense of debt I got myself in. It's my fault. I made bad choices. Help me over a series of events to come out of this thing. I'm crying out to you. See, there's something about that that does something to the heart of God. When we cry to him, when we see, you know what we're actually saying? I am your child. I am your kid. He, ne he never calls us the grown-ups of God. You have never been the grown-up of God. Maybe when you get to the kingdom, you'll be grown up. But right now, we're still the children of God. Amen. And I have found out about things about children. Hanging out again with my grandkids, I almost forgot about it with my other five kids. But this is what I found out. First, they don't like obedience. They're not good with obedience. Second, they don't like to swallow the word no. I said it over and over. Kids, Colton, Cassie, no. And then they'd say, and I say, swallow the word no. Did they would tell me? No. That ain't what I'm asking you, man. Learn how to swallow. And we, his children, we struggle with the same problem, obedience and swallowing the word no. There has to be a time we realize that we have lack in our lives. We have poverty in our lives. We've been wandered in our lives. We have less than in our lives than we thought we would have just placed in our life. Amen. And if it's not material, it's spiritual. 
We're not as far along in God as we wish we were. We not we don't really look at the Word of God and see the relevance of the Word. And because of that, we don't cry out. But to say, that answer there hits over and over. Then they cried. The response, watch the response in verse 8. Let them give thanks to the Lord for His unfailing love and His wonderful deeds for men. He brought forth the water. He brought bread, manna every day. They got up. They had banana, banana bread. They had manna souffle, manna casserole. And no, they didn't have manna casserole. Manna casserole would be left over. The manna was rotten the next day. So you had to eat it that day. Give us this day our daily manna. Amen. It's good for this day. So the power of this is understanding there are times in life that poverty is, and we've got to cry out to God. Amen. We got to make a little noise. We got to say, and again, it could be, it should be in your private time. I don't have to do it around other people, but learning to cry out to God. See, the problem is in our life, pessimism is a sign of spiritual uh, poverty. When people are pessimistic, honest to God, I cannot tolerate. It's the one thing. I tolerate a lot of stuff in my life, a lot of people in my life, but I cannot tolerate somebody who stays locked into pessimism. Especially when they tell me they know God. You love God and you still got this negative, woe is me. I'm down on myself. Nothing good ever happens for me. Every Facebook and every Instagram, every social media post you got is how bad things are. I, as a matter of fact, it gets overwhelming to see. Why I don't even know how you're still living. Amen. You are so negative. You are so down. And you serve the living God. And you are pessimistic. You are full of spiritual poverty. You need to cry out to God. Amen. And when you do, I'm telling you, God will turn things around in your life. This is why we give thanks for our food. I, I don't say, uh, I don't always say, Lord, bless the food. I say, Lord, I thank you for the food. I thank you for everything you provided for me. Amen. Well, I, well Pastor, you bought it. Yeah, I bought it. But he gave me the ability to make income, to make money in order to buy this food. So I'm going to give God thanks for this food. Amen. And I want to thank the cook that cooked it. I want to thank those that produced it. I stopped on my way leaving out of the little town of Rocky Ford, Colorado, which I found out was world, it's well known for melons. Watermelon, cantaloupe, all in me. I walked into that little uh, uh, farmer's market. Oh! Man, you're talking about country. You, you walk through Kroger, Walmart all you want, but you will never get the sensation I got in that farmer's market. Man, I could smell them fresh melons. It was almost overwhelming. I wanted to eat right then. The aroma just tore me up, Sister Linda, and I said, I'll take, I, I bought a cantaloupe bigger than the watermelon. Brought that thing home 900 miles. First thing I brought in the house, watermelon and cantaloupe. My, my car was just fumigated with those smells and aroma. I said, baby, cut this thing right now. Don't you wait. And by the way, I bought four peaches. And I ate a peach on the way home, and I reminded myself, Chase, and see that the Lord is good. This is good stuff. Did you know the next day that extra peach that I had, I had to share them, but the next day that extra peach I had was almost to the place you couldn't eat it. It was so ripe. Amen. I mean, I, I ate it. Over, you ever ate some over the trash can? Because <laughs> you know it's going to get all over the place. Huh? You know what I'm saying? Amen. I told Lord, I said, I done ate that last peach. It's gone. I ain't waiting another day for y'all to try to eat that thing. Y'all going to waste a good peach amen so we deal with it with the problem here poverty the second problem we run into here is is bondage and i'll use the word prison for p here such as sit verse 10 such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death being bound in affliction and iron did you know that there are a lot of afflictions of iron that you can't see people are bound they're bound up because they rebelled against the words of god this is King David talking. And contempt, contempted the counsel of the Most High. In other words, they didn't listen to God. Therefore, he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down, and there was none to help. This is heavy. As a matter of fact, some preachers are going to jump way over this. They can't say it. But I'm going to use a phrase you've heard me say a hundred times. If it's not God sent, it's God used. And people say, well, did God send this disease? In the Old Testament, the Bible speaks that God sent certain diseases 
on people because they refuse to listen to him. In the age of grace that we're in right now, we're careful as preachers not to say that because we don't want to make you mad at God. The issue is, I think it's time for you to understand there are times that we make God mad at us for the way we've lived in our disobedience. So I'm going to read that to you again. I want you to let it soak in. They sit in darkness in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction. There was a why, verse 11. Why? Because they rebelled against the words of God and contemned the counsel of the Most High. Therefore, he brought down their heart with labor. They had extra work to do. They fell down, and there was none to help. God humbles the arrogant. He, he has this way about not allowing you to be arrogant too long, too haughty, too, too all that, you know. I call them healing afflictions. Healing afflict. That, that's an oxymoron. That's a jumbo shrimp. That's sweet and sour pork. Amen. It's a healing as, afflictions. Amen. How can I get healed with an affliction? King David said in Psalm 119, 67, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. In other words, your afflictions healed me like the sheep that went astray from the 99 and the shepherd had to go. You know he had to break the leg of that sheep in order to keep the sheep with the 99. That's healing affliction. There are times you go through something in life and you say, you know, I was arrogant. I was all that. But then all of a sudden I found myself in the hospital barely able to breathe. I was stupid. I was driving too fast. This happened. That happened. I don't know. I ate something I shouldn't have ate. I did something I shouldn't have done. Next thing you know, here I am. But you know what? Oh, I cried unto the Lord and he heard me and delivered me out of my affliction. I just want to give thanks to him today because I ain't the same guy I was. Come on, Jesus. Amen. Answer them that cried unto the Lord in their trouble. He saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness, out of the shadow of death. He broke their bands and sunder. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for the wonderful works to the children of men. For he hath broken the gates of brass and cut the bars of iron and sunder. If you have ever been addicted to something, if something, some, some substance has ever owned you, some thought has ever captivated your mind all the time, you need to have that broke by the word of God. And when it breaks, you need to give God thanks. Amen. And watch out for the triggers that keep sending you back to it. Sometimes it's people that bring you back to it. Sometimes there's something that happens, a, a saying that happens. You've got to be aware of that and break those things asunder. Amen. Don't let it own you. you got too much life to live. The response, let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for me. I'm telling you, poverty is a problem. Be, being brought into a a place of, of prison, bondage. It's a problem in our lives. But there's only one answer. The name is Jesus. This brings us to the third one here that's really probably even harder to preach. I call it plague, just to give you another P here, but it's a problem. Verse 17, fools because of their transgression. Transgression. Let me stop this a second. I once read that our transgressions have often been transmitted through daddies and grandpas, not so much mamas, but are often passed down through the sins of the Father. He forgave us our transgressions and our sins. They're, they're curses almost. You know, that's that, like as a dad, uh, grandpa, I have to be careful that what I've done could be passed down so easily to my kids, and then I want my kids to break those curses. Can I get any man? I'm not going, I'm trying not to get too heavy here, but you'll every now and then, sir, you'll look in the mirror and you swear you just saw your daddy looking back at you. Amen. You'll say something, you think, well, that was my daddy. And sometimes you boast about it. And other times you wish to God you'd never said it. Amen. You learned it from there. Fools because of their transgressions. Trans, transgress also means trespass, to, to, to go where you shouldn't. And because of their iniquities, I'm sorry, the, the word iniquity is more of the of the passing down of uh, a father's sins are afflicted. I knew it was in there somewhere. They're so abhorreth all manner of meat, and they draw near unto the gates of death. You've noticed that when most people start preparing to leave this earth, their body diminishes. It becomes frail. Uh, it, it loses weight. Muscle strength is hard to gain again. This is a natural 
way of leaving this planet, your earth suit is giving up and going back. But if in the middle somewhere in your life, your body starts dropping weight and you notice you're losing strength, you know something is wrong. Sometimes it's not your fault. It's the sickness that came upon you, a, a cancer, a disease. But then there are things that we can do that will cause disease to enter our bodies. And this is where I need to be careful. They are afflicted. Their soul abhors all manner of meat, and they draw near unto the gates of death. Even if there were medicines and masks and mandates, certain people cannot stop certain diseases because they cannot be obedient and swallow a no. You can stay quiet. Y'all need to stay quiet. Don't say nothing here. Amen. But they can't do it. We've got a thing now that they are declaring a uh, emergency, but it only affects 99% of gay men. It's called monkeypox. Matter of fact, they're trying to change the name of it to keep from sounding so offensive. The bottom line is our hearts should be feeling for people, reaching for people, and loving people no matter what they're going through in life. But on the flip side, to try to teach people, be obedient to God, and learn to swallow no. Are you hearing me? See, many times churches will get up and rail against the uh, the MF LGBTQ group. I added two letters there. Y'all know about the MF LGBTQ group? MF is uh, males and females. Get your mind right. We need to make sure everybody's included in the alphabet. Can you get an amen? Uh, they need a voice of good news. They need compassion. See, I believe everybody can be delivered. I believe everybody can get their stuff right. I know there are people in this house, you're affected by this a lot more than I am, and I love you. But their disease is already condemning them. Whether it was AIDS, whether it was uh, uh, an STD, whether it was, and most of these diseases seem to be sexual, all the way around. Whether it's heterosexual or homosexual, they're all the way around. So when I read this, I'm thinking to myself, David saw this thousands of years ago, and he said, you know what I noticed? Fools. He used the word fool. The Bible said, be careful who you call fool. Say, if you call people fool, you can be in danger of hellfire. And then Jesus turned around and called a man a fool. See, when you read out of your English Bible, it's that, that's contradictory. But when you read it out of, the, out of the Greek, you realize there's several different fools. When you go to the Hebrew, which is the Old Testament, you'll find out there's the pig-headed fool. Pig-headed fool can't leave the refrigerator alone. Pig-headed. Then there's the bull-headed fool. The bullheaded fool struggles with anger. They get themselves in trouble because of their anger. You don't know nobody like that. So there's all kind of fools in the Bible. Amen. Don't look around. But he calls them here fools because of their transgressions, because of their iniquities are afflicted. They're so abhorrent all manner. They can't eat. They're ebbing away. Their bodies are going. It speaks of a sudden outburst of pestilence, which is regarded as coming from God as a punishment for evil. And again, to say this, almost they say, well, you say God did, God sent that kind of sickness on people? Let me tell you, I think God is, uh, is a little mad, is a little tired of it. Amen. But I can't take his place, so I will tell you this. I, I, I think God is not mad at us personally, but I think he's fed up with us not saying no. He's, not, he's fed up with us not being obedient. He's fed up with us doing our own thing all the time. So it comes, to, it comes from, again, if it's not God sent, it's, God used, and God can use this to start driving people back to him. They need a voice of good news. So the answer is they cried, and, they, and when they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, he saved them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. So they're not beyond healing. They're not beyond helping. All they got to do is like the rest of anybody in this house is hearing this word, cry unto the Lord, swallow your pride, swallow that word no. And when you do that, cry to him and say, God, forgive me of my sins. Help me turn around. I've been in poverty too long. I've been in bondage of prison and addiction too long. I've been doing my own thing with the wrong people too long. God, in the name of Jesus, help me out at this moment. And the Bible says he heard their cry. How'd you get well? God heard me. 
He heard me. I was desperate, and he heard me. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble. He saved them out of their distresses. Again, the response, let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. His un so here, a third problem, not just uh, uh, poverty, not just prison and, and addictions and bondage, not just plague, diseases that are brought on by wrong living, but now we find just pilgrims. Fourth P. I told Cheryl, I'm probably going to shut this message short, and I feel I got to now because I'm one-third through right now. You know what the blessing is? God might give me another Sunday. Uh-huh. Maybe. Verse 23. They that go down to the sea in ships, that do business in great waters. This is why I call them pilgrims. These see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commands and raises the stormy wind, which lifts up the waves thereof. Have you ever been out on the sea, on the ocean, and you no longer can see land? And the water starts coming up. And all of a sudden, you start realizing that it was God. Oh, you, you don't know it was God, but you're going to act like he's God. And you're going to start crying out to him, Lord, stop the waves. Lord, settle this boat down. One thing when the boat's in the water, another thing when the water's in the boat. Amen. Lord, do something right here right now. The Bible says he commands and raises the stormy wind. He lifts up the waves thereof. They mount up to the heaven. They go down to the depths. Their soul is melted because of trouble. They, you know, listen, I don't care how fearless you are. When them waves, I watch deadliest catch. I've seen them boys throwing up in the seas. I know what happens when that wave comes over the top of them big vessels. Amen. They, they're screaming out to God. Ain't one of them in there yells devil. It's Jesus, man. I mean, they're calling out to God at that moment because this thing is happening. They reel to and fro. They stagger like a drunken man. Men are at their wit's end. W-I-T-S. Have you ever stayed at wit's end? It's a hotel when you're in trouble. Wit's end. Amen. And that's where they were. They were at their wit's end. They were simply passing through. The Bible don't say they had issues with poverty. It don't say they had issues with plagues. It don't say they had issues with prison. It just says they pilgrims. I'm just passing through. Amen. I'm, I'm actually doing pretty good. Love Jesus. I stand in his righteousness, doing the right thing. I'm a giver to the house of God. I pray on Tuesday night. Amen. I, I, I support the youth ministry and the children. I'm just, I drive a, 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 anything but a Chevy. I'm a good, I don't own cats. I'm a good fella. Actually, when you think about it, life's just good. I'm just moving right along. And then it happens. You find out that you also are going to need to cry out to the Lord. That you're going to find yourself in some T-R-O-U-B-L-E. I, I rode that train. That's a train that goes to the top of 14,000 feet of Pikes Peak called the Cog. I took my grandkids. We went all the way to the top of Pikes Peak. Thank God we took pictures before we got there because when we got there, we were in the clouds, and I couldn't see y'all. It was that bad. I took a picture, sent it to the Lord. I said, this is our view from here. It was no view at all. But we took pictures of rams on the way up. And, and they, uh, Speaking of rams, while I'm on my way out of the parking lot, and again, I, I consider myself an all right fella. I'm not really struggling with poverty much anymore or, or plagues much anymore or prison much anymore. But I'm just running through life up and down over and over, you know, just enjoying life. Got grandkids in the back, daughter in the front, and I'm standing there and I'm waiting. I'm sitting, I'm waiting. I got to knock the Toyota. I mean, you remember the Toyota I told you about when my, my wife had had the issues and running into stuff when it has all that nice stuff on it? Well, it sure came back to bite me quick. Sometimes I just need to keep my mouth shut because here I am on the side of that hill going down like this, and I look in this Dodge truck. It's not his turn, but I'm a nice guy. Hey, I'm a pilgrim passing through. Come on up, sir. He gets right in front of me. Talking to the kids, knock the car off in the neutral, sitting there on the side of the hill going down. I'm about as far as from here to Mary right here. All right, so I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm thinking, okay, it's going to be my turn to move, punch out, and I get to go on about my merry way. I'm going down to the Mountain Man Club uh, store and buy me a couple of new shirts, you know. 
And I sat in there, and all of a sudden, everybody moves forward. So I knocked the thing in gear, put it in gear, Kenny, and I put my tennis shoe on the brake. Thing is, I barely had it on the brake, and when I pushed the brake, I was pushing the accelerator at the same time. All of a sudden, I'm in a one-second dilemma in which I cannot get out of. I've been driving for 45 years. This has never happened to me. But the harder I pushed the brake, in panic to stop, I was pushing the accelerator at the same time. Now I'm in trouble. I'm trying to shove the thing into, I mean, I'm trying to get it into park. You can see where I almost bent the gear shift. I'm hitting it. And oh, and not one curse word came out of my mouth. Not one slang word. I cried unto the Lord, and I still hit that Dodge truck. <laughs> it said Ram on the back. Hit that thing, man. All of a sudden, Karen jumped out of it. Y'all know who Karen is? She's a blonde. Ah! Thank God I only hit it at 10 feet. She'd have been dead on a stretcher if it had been further than that. Hey, man, she jumped. I just walked right past her. Didn't pay her no mind. She wasn't driving. Walked right up to the driver. He's smiling. I'm smiling. We, we exchange all our stuff, you know, and I think, my goodness, man, how did you, I, I, this is freaky. It's freaky. It damaged the front of that Toyota, knocked out the cruise control, had to drive home 900 miles out cruise. It's just a pain. And uh, I, I had to go, oh, we call that old school, going old school, you know. So I got back home, and uh, uh, before I got home, I got a call from my wife, Sister Lauren. She said, you ain't going to believe what happened to me. I said, well, let me tell you about mine first. Let me go ahead and get this out the way. Let me go ahead and tell you that I apologize for me talking about the way you drive, how you hit everything over the last 15 years. How did I, I, I ran the back of a Dodge truck today, put a big old hole inside your Toyota. I got to get it fixed and get home. Thank God for insurance. She said, well, let me tell you what happened to me today. I said, okay, baby, tell me what happened to you today. She said, I was on 99, sat there dead stop, and a Chevrolet run right in the back of me, bent the hood, and just, just destroyed the back end of this car I just got from my daddy. I said, you kidding me? Not you. In 24 hours, up, down, up, down, waves coming. It just like, it, it ha listen, life happens to everybody. Everybody, everybody going to go through life. Amen. Whether you be in poverty, in prison, in plague, or pilgrim, you're going to go through some life. And when life happens to you, do me a favor. Do the Word of God. Cry out to the Lord. Get private with Him. Have a little time with Him. Cry out and ask Him for deliverance and help. That's what I did. And then I reminded myself this. This is funny. I, I, I got all by myself, and I said, count it all joy, Jesus, Jerry. Count it all joy, Jesus. Jerry, count it out, joy, Jerry. Count it out, joy. <laughs> and I said that until I could smile again because it was not joyful at the time. <laughs> Amen. That's just the way it is. Answer them, they cried. Let them give thanks. I'm closing here. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. Why do you give God thanks for your food? Because of his unfailing love, his continual mercies. He never stops. He's never stopped. This word is historical, and it's very prophetic for today. Amen. To go to Psalm 107 and say, God, I see myself there. At one time or another, can I tell you something? I've been in poverty. I know what it's like to have lack, to not have as much of, to be in need of. I know what it's like to get a $20 bill and make it till payday four days later, knowing i got to fill up a a 1970 Nova that got four miles to the gallon. Wonder how I'm going to make it. I know what it's like to live in poverty. I understand prison and addiction. As a young boy, I started drinking when I was six years old. My first beer was a Slitz malt liquor. Amen. Six years old, my daddy gave it to me. By the time I was 16 years old, I tried every way I could to make sure I was drunk at least one day a week, and I was in high school. By the time I graduated, it became seven days a week. Amen. It's, I, somebody said, Pastor, when's the last time you had a drink? I want to tell you, November the 9th, 1979. Because I got saved November the 10th, 1979. I know what it's like to have addictions. I understand plagues in life. Amen. My body had been racked with a disease that I was born with. I fight it all the time. Uh, there are times that I can barely move my legs, and I know that it's getting harder and harder. But I cry out to the Lord 
and he heard me in my distress. I know what it's like to be a pilgrim just passing through. I was just passing through Crosby 30-something years ago. I was passing through this town, and God spoke to me and said, this is where I'm going to put you. And I fought to stay here and to be in this town. I understand being a pilgrim. Life just happens. And if it don't happen to you, it's going to happen to somebody you love. They'll be in an accident. They'll pass away. They'll get sick. Something will happen, and it will affect you. Your answer is not on this Sunday, not just this Sunday. Your answer from this day forward is to cry unto the Lord in your distress. It's not to make that first phone call to your pastor, to your doctor, to your lawyer, to your friend. Your first answer is to cry in distress, to get along with him and say, God, help me. I need you now. You are his child. He knows you struggle with swallowing no. He knows you struggle with disobedience. He knows that about you. But when you break through and you cry out to him, he'll say, that's my boy. That's my girl. Amen. And he'll hear your prayer. Let me read this to you out of the message and we close. Oh, thank God he's so good. His love never runs out. All of you set free by God, tell the world. Tell the world you got set free. Tell how he freed you from oppression. Then rounded you up from all over the place, from the four winds, north, south, east, and west, the seven seas. Verse 4. Some of you wandered for years in the desert looking, but you didn't find a good place to live. See, you were detouring till God brought you here. Amen. Looking but not finding a good place to live. Half starved and parched with thirst. Staggering and stumbling on the brink of exhaustion. Then in your desperate condition, you called out to God. He got you out in the nick of time. He put your feet on a wonderful road that took you straight to a good place to live. So thank God for his marvelous love, for his miracle mercy to the children he loves. He poured great drafts of water down parched throats. He starved. And the starved and hungry got plenty to eat. Verse 10. Some of you were locked in dark cell, cruelly confined behind bars, punished for defying the God, God's word, for turning your back on the high God's counsel, a hard sentence in your heart so heavy and not a soul in sight to help. Then you called out to God in your desperate condition. He got you out of it in the nick of time. He led you out of your dark, dark cell, broke open the jail, and led you out. So thank God for his marvelous love, for his miracle, mercy to the children he loves. He shattered the heavy jailhouse doors. He snapped the prison bars like matchsticks. Verse 17. Some of you were sick because you had lived a bad life. Your bodies were feeling the effects of your sin. You couldn't stand the sight of food so miserable you thought you'd be better off dead. Then you called out to God in your desperate condition. <laughs> he got to you in, in the nick of time. He spoke the word that healed you, that pulled you back from the brink of death. So thank God for his marvelous love, for his miracle mercy to the children he loves. Offer thanksgiving sacrifices. Tell the world what he's done. Sing it out loud. Verse 23. Some of you set sail in big ships. Be put to sea to do business in faraway ports. Out at sea, you, you saw God in action, saw his breath taking waves with the ocean. With a word, he called up the wind, an ocean storm, towering waves. You shot high in the sky, then the bottom dropped out. Your hearts were stuck in your throats. You were spun like a top and reeled like a drunk. You didn't know which end was up. Then you called out to God in your desperate condition. Guess what? He got you out in the nick of time. He quieted the wind down to a whisper, put a muzzle on all the big waves, and you were so glad when the storm died down. He, and he led you safely back to a harbor. So thank God for his marvelous love, for his miracle mercy to the children he loves. Lift high your praises. Then the people assembled. Shout hallelujah when the elders meet. Whew. It's good, isn't it? That's good stuff. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father, we're a people that have gone through poverty, prison, plague, and pilgrims. We've struggled through life at times. Remind us as your children to be obedient and swallow the word no 
when you say it. God, I thank you for this house. I thank you for those that are watching. God, I pray that we learn how to cry out to you. Amen. And in our distress, you heard our voice and delivered us from our troubles. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, give him praise.